Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the library at Calvary Road Baptist Church in Monrovia, California. Uh, we are still in the People's Republic of California at the south end in the gulag known as Los Angeles County. I'm glad to be with you. Um, if you're watching this session on YouTube, please remember to subscribe to this YouTube channel and click the bell reminder to be notified of uploads from the channel if you're not watching via live streaming. If you'd like to receive an email invitation to the upcoming Zoom sessions, please send your request to me and I will pass it on. Again, that is, that is um, pastor at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Pastor at Calvary Road Baptist Church either a question or a request to be notified of upcoming sessions. And if you put Zoom 83 in the subject line, I will know which of your sessions you are referring to. Now, in January, I began addressing the question, what is spirit baptism? And I did a half a dozen or uh, perhaps one or two more sessions on that. And I suggested then that it is a more significant question than many people realize, <clears throat> since the answer affects a congregation's approach to their observation of the communion of the Lord's Supper, uh, their approach to church discipline, and their grasp of the whole concept of unity in the Christian community, um, and their, un, and, their, and their understanding of whole chapters in the New Testament dealing with the body of Christ. Uh, I've got a problem with this view, and I'm going to make a gallery view. I should make it speaking view, shouldn't I? Shouldn't I? I don't know how to do that. So... Um, I guess I'm going to do speaker view, and I'm the speaker, so why am I not being highlighted? Let's see. Uh, participants. You know, I don't know how to do this. I've, I'm doing something wrong, but I don't have... Um, I don't have a clue as to how I'm proceeding on this. Anyway, I'll just continue on and we'll, and we'll work on it. Um, the last seven weeks, I have set aside my discussion uh, of spirit baptism to interview a number of our church's missionaries, uh, several of whose couples serve in sensitive parts, uh, uh, several of those couples serve in, in sensitive parts of the world, and, and they requested no video be made of the Zoom session, but the other are on our YouTube channel, and they are well worth watching. I just have a problem with this. I want to, I want to make my view, let's just go full screen. No, that's not the way to do it. I don't know how to do that. Anyway, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, we're going to be okay. Anyway, I wanted to Zoom our set up Zoom sessions with three of our remaining missionaries, but two of them have never been on Zoom before. So they will learn how to do that over the next week or two, since it only requires clicking a link that we send them while using a computer with a camera and a microphone. And so tonight, uh, I return to this issue of spirit baptism, focusing on the implications to Christians of there being no ongoing spirit baptism of everyone who comes to Christ. Let me say that again. There is no ongoing spirit baptism of everyone who comes to Christ. So before we get into that, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Please bless our session. Um, the appropriate conclusions drawn from six weeks of conversation and consideration of Scripture. Bless this session, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
No Spirit Baptism, that's what I have titled this session. A um, <clears throat> couple of things uh, in response to this question. First, um, Spirit Baptism, contrary to what most Protestants believe, Spirit Baptism was never a universal Christian experience. Most people don't realize that. If you go to Acts chapter 2, you will see that of the thousands that are gathered, the only ones who experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit were the 120 who were already believers in Jesus Christ. There is absolutely no mention in the book of Acts of the 3,000 who came to Christ on the day of Pentecost uh, ever, ever being baptized with or in the Holy Spirit of God. Um, if you go to Acts chapter 8, there are a discrete number of believers who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you go to Acts chapter 10, a discrete number of believers, and they were already believers. In each case, the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurs in the lives of those already believers in Christ. Acts chapter 10, the same thing. Acts chapter 19, uh, we find that uh, even though they had not been believers for very long, they were already believers in Jesus Christ. But this is what you can find if you look for it. You find that spirit baptism was never a universal Christian experience. That's significant. That's significant because it helps put into perspective the relative significance of this thing we call spirit baptism. Secondly, spirit baptism was predicted to be and was a sign. Uh, during the ministry of John the Baptist, they asked him if he was, he was the Messiah. He said, no. Uh, there's one coming after me who is mightier than I. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit was predicted by John the Baptist and was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19, fulfilled his prediction of it being an authenticating sign identifying Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel. <clears throat> now, here's something that needs to be asked, and this will be a, a, a especially appropriate for the consideration of those of you who really enjoy the study of prophecy. A prediction has to be fulfilled how many times for the prophecy to be fulfilled? Only once only once. It doesn't need to be fulfilled any more than one time, and yet the baptism of the Holy Spirit prediction was fulfilled once, Acts chapter 2. A second time, Acts chapter 8 in Samaria. A third time in the household of Cornelius in Caesarea, Acts chapter 10. And a fourth time in the city of Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. So there is no ongoing requirement for the prediction of John the Baptist to be fulfilled. It has already been fulfilled once, twice, thrice, and I don't know how you say four times cleverly. So spirit baptism was predicted to be and was a sign, okay? Nothing that is purported to be spirit baptism in the day in which we live, nothing to be spirit that is purported to be spirit baptism uh, for the last almost 2,000 years is a sign, something worth consideration. Third, spirit baptism was never intended to facilitate incorporation into the universal invisible body of Christ. Never, never. 
the way the theology is is described um let me let me correct this here <clears throat> the way protestants describe their theology of the baptism of the holy spirit is they believe that at the time of conversion, the baptism of the Spirit incorporates someone into the universal invisible body of Christ. Now, there's a couple of problems that I'll just bring to your attention from our previous studies that you can go back on the YouTube channel and take a look at. Uh, number one, um, Protestants are of the opinion that, that, bapti the, that Spirit baptism takes place at the time of conversion though there is no incidence in the book of Acts of spirit baptism ever occurring at the time of conversion. It was always subsequent to conversion. Secondly, um, there, there is no indication in the Bible that there is such a thing as a universal invisible body of Christ. Uh, the 121 times that the word ecclesia is found in the Greek New Testament some 117 or 18 of those times, the word ecclesia is referring to an easily identifiable congregation, and the four times that it's not referring to a specific congregation, it's referring to the church as an institution. <clears throat> I was recently talking to a missionary to Greece whose first language was Greek. I mean, he spoke Greek, I mean, his whole life, and I asked him about the, the idea uh, to Greek speakers of the word ecclesia referring to some ungathered, invisible, non-assembled assemblage of people, and he said um, such would not be imagined by Greek-speaking people, and so... Um, you can, you can go to the University uh, of California at Irvine, where they have the largest repository of uh, Greek language data of anywhere in the world. And uh, they've got a whole, a whole portion of, of their school dedicated to it. It's available online. I think it's called Lingua Greca uh, online. And there is no incident anywhere in Greek, in Attican Greek, the golden age of Greece, Koine Greek during the time of Christ and the apostles or any time subsequent since then, that the Greek word uh, referring to the church, ecclesia, was ever used by the Greeks to refer to something not gathered and visible, okay? Like the United States Senate or the House of Representatives, um, um, a, a, a club, something like that. And so spirit baptism was never intended to facilitate incorporation into the universal invisible uh, body of Christ. Fourth, spirit baptism was never intended to be either symbolic of water baptism or intended to be the reality with water baptism being symbolic of it. Um, this is not to say that water baptism doesn't symbolize certain things, but it is an actual thing. This is not to suggest that spirit baptism did not symbolize certain things, but at the time it was an actual thing. The way Protestant theologians get around the difficulties with spirit baptism and their, their desire to connect it to John's prediction, their desire to connect it to Acts chapters 2, 8, 10, and 19, is by claiming that water baptism was merely symbolic and spirit baptism is the actual and the genuine. Uh, yet, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul is very clear in communicating to the church that is at Ephesus that during the last years of his life, as he wrote that letter, there was only one baptism. 
Now, are you going to try to convince me that the one baptism that was extant at the time of Paul's writing his letter to the Ephesians was not the baptism of the Great Commission? Was not the baptism um, administered by <clears throat> by uh, the apostles? Was not the baptism administered in, at, during his time of ministry by John the Baptist? Uh, I'm going to have a real hard time believing that, especially since baptism, water baptism, immersion of a believer um, in response to the command of Christ is an integral part of the Great Commission. So please don't tell me that it's uh, only, whatever that means, symbolic of something else, and that by the time Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, it was no longer being practiced. I know otherwise. I know otherwise. So spirit baptism was not intended to be symbolic of water baptism, and water baptism uh, was not intended to be symbolic of spirit baptism. Not to say that each of them is not symbolic of something else, but they don't cross-pollinate in that way at all in the New Testament. Fifth, spirit baptism was never intended to be an ongoing experience for all Christians. I've already pointed out that at the beginning of the Christian era, in Acts chapter 2, the 120 were baptized with or in the Holy Spirit of God, but the 3,000 were not. And a discrete number in Acts chapter 8, a discrete number in Acts chapter 10, a discrete number in Acts chapter 19 received the baptism with or in the Holy Spirit of God. But there is no indication in the Bible that spirit baptism was ever intended to be or ever needed to be the ongoing experience for all Christians or the ongoing experience of all Christians. Uh, it, there's, just, there's just no evidence to support that notion. Sixth, spirit baptism was designed, as I mentioned before, was designed to be an authenticating sign identifying Israel's Messiah. That was the prediction of John the Baptist. So in order for spirit baptism to have occurred, it had to be something that was a sign. 1 Corinthians 1.22, Greeks seek after signs, Gentiles seek after wisdom. Greeks require, uh, Jews require a sign, excuse me. <clears throat> and in order for it to be a sign, there had to be something accompanying the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which was uh, detected by one of the five senses or more. Now, on the day of Pentecost, uh, you could see Tobin, <laughs> see Tobin. On the day of Pentecost, you could see cloven tongues as of fire. You could hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. And then you could hear those standing in front of them speaking in other languages, speaking tongues in tongues. So there was audible signs and there were visual signs. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, uh, audible signs. Acts chapter 10, audible signs. Acts chapter 19, audible signs. And yet, when I came to Christ, uh, there was nothing to be seen or heard that would suggest I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So is all of a sudden... Um, the, the prediction of John the Baptist adjusted so that it's no longer a sign uh, and no longer intended for a Jewish audience? So where do you justify that conclusion? How do you support that with Scripture? Uh, it was an authenticating sign identifying Israel's Messiah, and I believe that the four occasions in which we know spirit baptism occurred and was recorded by Dr. Luke in the book of Acts, I think the baptism of the Holy Spirit succeeded in authenticating 
the Messiahship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seventh, no one can prove they have been baptized in the Holy Spirit because the supposed accompanying features are missing or fraudulent. I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit when I gave my personal testimony a moment or two ago, but I came to Christ in my apartment in Torrance, California on March the 31st, 1974, uh, about two o'clock in the morning. I didn't wake up any neighbors. Uh, nobody heard anything. Uh, nobody saw anything. Even if they had been in my apartment with me, there was nothing to be seen and nothing that could have been heard. Why? Because I was not baptized with the Holy Spirit, yet I had trusted Christ as my Savior I was born again by the power of God. The Spirit of God did indwell me. You say, well, but you're missing something. Well, something is missing. I don't know that I'm missing anything, but something was missing. What was missing was the baptism of the Holy Spirit because it was never the intention uh, of God to make sure that every believer down through Christian history experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, people, it's not a thing. And the reason people cling so tenaciously to the baptism of the Holy Spirit being a thing is because if they're wrong about that, they're wrong about their doctrine of the church. They're wrong about so many other things. And people simply, once they are heavily invested in a certain position, they simply do not want to reconsider that position and, and, um, and redress the issue. Um, and that's just the way people are, I'm sorry to say. So in conclusion, uh, for this relatively short um, um, Zoom session, spirit baptism was once a thing. It was predicted to be a thing by John the Baptist. It was shown to be a thing in Acts chapter 2. It was shown to be a thing in Acts chapter 8. It was shown to be a thing in Acts chapter 10. It was shown to be a thing in Acts chapter 19. And the reason no one can show it to be a thing any longer is because it's no longer a thing. Having fulfilled its purpose, it is no longer required. We now have the word of God completed, and we've had it for 2,000 years, and it is in Scripture, it is in Scripture that the Lord Jesus Christ is shown to be the Messiah of Israel. Uh, spirit baptism was needed until the completion of the New Testament. The New Testament is now completed. Spirit baptism is needed no more. It's a vestige of a, of, of, a, of a transitional era in Christian history and is not any longer. If you have a question, please feel free to speak up now or forever hold your peace. Actually not. Feel free to reach out to me at pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church, and please submit your question, uh, leaving in the subject line Zoom 83, so I will know what uh, Zoom session you are referring to. Thank you so much for joining with us this evening, and if you're viewing this at a later time, I hope it's been a blessing to you. Let's dismiss this, wrap this all up, get this over with, with a word of prayer, shall we? Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for the opportunity that we've had to be here this evening, and pray that you might bless our time, that you might use this Zoom session, this YouTube video, to be an encouragement and a help to people who are wrestling with some things that it might provide clarity, and for that, we will thank you in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and good night.